Good morning, everyone. I'm Ranjit Kumar. I'm a software engineer at Meta, passionate about distributed systems. I had the pleasure of working in these systems at scale over the last five years, but it continues to amaze me how the challenges evolve over the time. I'm here with Kenny Yu, who will join us in a bit to talk about how at Meta capacity management challenges evolved and how we are evolving to global capacity management. In previous systems at scale, we talked about how we are scaling cluster management with Twine and how we are handling perpetual regional wide resource allocation with RAS. These are fundamental systems that provide us abstractions and automation necessary for the service owners to be more mission agnostic within a region. While this is great, what happens when the number of regions we have grows? Right now, we have 21 data centers and over the next coming years, we will continue to grow. At this scale, the complexity and toil from managing and operating capacity at a per geographic region basis would become intolerable at a point in the journey. From an efficiency point of view, we might not be able to better leverage our hardware in the most optimized way. These challenges enabled us to start thinking more globally. How can we enable our services to think more regional agnostic? What are some of the abstractions, tools, and automations we need to do that? The solution is to think of world as a computer. I'm sure many of you would have read the data center as a computer. Similarly, what if we are able to think of, think and perceive the world as a computer? We would then be able to both think, operate, and optimize globally. This will allow the services to move from a machine agnostic world to a regional agnostic world. But how do we get there? What are some of the challenges on our way there? Some of this include our ability to handle latency and locality requirements, and the growing complexity around disaster readiness, handling various privacy considerations, and our ability to avoid the heterogeneity in various data centers. These are some of fundamental challenges that prevent us from becoming more regional agnostic. So when we think of global capacity management at scale, Kenny will join us to talk about the various approaches and insights we have about this, diving in more into the technical details. Thanks, Ranjith. Hi, everyone. I'm Kenny, and I'm a software engineer at Meta. I've been working on cluster management for the past eight years. I'm really, really excited to share with you how we've continued to evolve cluster management over time. Since I presented Twine in 2019, we've progressed from the regional abstractions to the global abstractions that we're presenting today. For supporting global services, we, we observed that there are two common types of services. Services that are latency sensitive and services that are latency tolerant. When you use some of Meta's products like the Facebook or Instagram apps on your phone, you expect a fast response when loading photos and videos. These workloads are typically served by latency-sensitive services. However, some parts of our products are latency-tolerant. For example, when a friend comments on your video, it might be okay to receive that notification a few seconds or minutes late. Or when you upload a large video, it's okay to wait a few minutes for the video to be uploaded and processed. These workloads are typically served by latency-tolerant services. In order to support latency-sensitive services, we must consider the location of the services that are upstream and downstream of that service to make sure they're located nearby. These services cannot be independently moved of their dependencies. Whereas for latency tolerant services, we don't have this constraint and we have the full flexibility to change the placement of these services as needed. We built global reservations to simplify global capacity management for latency tolerant services and we built regional fluidity to simplify global capacity management for latency sensitive services. I'll dive into global reservations and Ranjith will dive into regional fluidity later in this talk. To understand global reservations role in capacity management, let's rewind the clock back to 2021. Last year, we presented RAS at Systems at Scale and RAS provides a foundation for capacity management within a region. Service owners create a regional reservation to run their workloads and reservations provide strong guarantees about placement of their capacity. RAS then performs continuous region-wide optimizations to improve this placement. However, 
this approach was no longer sufficient as our scale continued to grow. Service owners needed to worry about how much capacity to provision in each region to be fault tolerant. And as the number of regions continued to grow, and as we performed more hardware decommissions and refresh, and as the number of new regions are being turned up, this added more and more complexity for service owners to manage. We observed that a subset of these services are globally available and often do not have latency constraints. These service owners wanted a simpler way to reason about their capacity globally with guarantees. We created global reservations to meet this need. Instead of creating individual reservations within each region, the service owner creates a single global reservation, and the global reservation service will take care of figuring out how much capacity to allocate in each region to meet this demand and to be fault tolerant. Since these services are latency tolerant, they can be easily shifted across regions. And we leverage this to continuously run global-wide optimizations to improve the placement. We then modify Twine to run at a global scope to allocate containers on this global reservation. Let's look at an example from a service owner's perspective on how they would interact with global reservations. In this example, the service owner requests 300 servers in North America. This service owner does not care about which particular set of regions their service runs in, as long as they have sufficient capacity to meet their demand and to tolerate the loss of any single region. The Global Reservation Service decides to provision 150 servers, each in three different regions, for a total of 450 servers. The extra 150 machines serves as a fault tolerance buffer, so that if we lose any region, the other regions still have sufficient capacity. Over time, as we increase the number of regions, the Global Reservation Service will automatically spread the capacity over more regions. As an example, Suppose we had 11 regions. We can then allocate 30 machines each in of the 11 regions for a total of 330 machines and still be fault tolerant. This means that we can be more efficient with the fault tolerance buffer as we increase the number of regions over time. Overall, global reservations helps simplify global capacity management. Global reservations perform continuous optimizations globally, improving the service placement over time. Global reservations are declarative and intent-based. Instead of service owners hard-coding specific regions, global reservations help service owners encode their intent, and this provides flexibility to infrastructure to improve the placement over time. Lastly, global reservations help simplify reasoning about fault tolerance. Global reservations automatically provisions fault tolerance buffers for service owners, and then automatically resizes the fault tolerance buffer as needed. And this helps us improve efficiency, and fault tolerance over time. Now let's dive a bit deeper into how global reservations work. At the core of the global reservation service is a solver for an assignment problem, where we assign objects to bins. In our case, the objects are machines, and the bins are global reservations. The table on the right visualizes this assignment problem. Each row corresponds to machine, and each column corresponds to a global reservation. Each entry has an assignment variable x, which is either 0 or 1, indicating if that machine is assigned to that particular global reservation. We can encode various constraints and objectives in this format. As an example, the variables in the red row must sum up to be 1, representing that a machine can be assigned to exactly one global reservation. The variables in the green column must sum up to be greater or equal to the amount requested by the global reservation in that column indicating we must assign enough machines to fulfill the service owner's request. The solver figures out the assignment of the variables to satisfy all constraints and to optimize for various goals. Let's look at a particular example of what the solver output might look like. This example, the global reservation has two machines assigned in region one and one machine assigned in region two. It is how we generate the regional reservations for RAS to then materialize in each region. We run the solver continuously to improve the placement. This approach works well for latency tolerant services that can be easily shifted in isolation, but this approach doesn't work so well for latency sensitive services, where we must consider the placement of upstream and downstream dependencies as well. I'll now hand it over to Ranjith to talk about how we provide global capacity management for latency sensitive services. Thank you, Kenny, for a great overview of global reservations. Now, when we think of latency sensitive services and how do we scale global capacity management for them, we need the ability to safely place them and move them. 
So essentially, we need the ability to understand the services co-location and geographic distribution requirements. We get this by attributing demand for these services. Demand is essentially what drives the service and our ability to attribute the demand and model the services allows us a way to both rebalance them and redistribute them based on how we see the demand source. Now, regional fluidity is a system that leverages these capabilities of infrastructure to safely move these services towards a globally optimized plan. So what is attributing demand source? Most latency sensitive services have co-location requirements to reduce or eliminate cross-regional traffic. Now, for example, various feed services must be located in the same region as FB Blue, which is their front end app. So in this example, we can see that the feed is driven by both two different demand sources. One of them is Facebook Blue, but also there is Instagram. And there are few services which are driven only by Instagram. This gives us an idea of how the service capacity is tied to the demand source. Now, this also makes it very clear that the service capacity cannot be allocated arbitrarily. The capacity must instead be following the demand source and the set of front-end drivers that determine their capacity needs. There are few restrictions for what can be considered a demand source, and they must be independently placeable, they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, and they generally do not leave the region. Once we are able to attribute and understand demand source for the various services, we can now leverage it as a lever to move it around. In this example, we are seeing how we are shifting demand for a single demand source. For simplicity, we have taken one demand source and few services, and we are shifting it from region A to region B. Now, in the initial state, we are observing there are few services driven by the same demand source at varying proportions, and we have available capacity in region B. We distribute this capacity to the services based on how that service is driven by the demand proportionally, and once we are able to distribute the capacity, we are then able to safely move the demand, knowing that these services are able to withstand the new demand. Since demand is a zero-sum game, we are then able to safely reclaim the capacity back from the source region we move the demand out of. Now, this shows how we are able to move services in a safer way and redistribute them. As you can see, the process can be complex even for a simple two region scenario. Now, when we have at scale multiple demand sources and multiple regions, we need a better way to do this. This is where regional fluidity comes in. Leveraging a solver here allows us to produce a placement plan that covers multiple demand sources and also iteratively allows us to go towards a globally optimized plan. So the solver takes in the various constraints, optimization functions, demand attribution, supply, and so on, and able to come up with a feasible plan that improves towards the, towards the goals we are optimizing for. The advantage here being able to optimize globally than just region. Once the plan is generated, we execute the plan through orchestration. Orchestrator's role is to drive the execution of the plan end to end, sequencing the various actions that is required to automate this plan. So in a simple example, the orchestrator distributes capacity, sizes up the various services that are going to get impacted by the demand shift, then proceeds to do the validations and performing the actual shift. And once we safely shift it, we then sort of reduce the services and reclaim the capacity back. So what does this enable towards global capacity management? Firstly, we are able to optimize globally trading off local inefficiencies for better global outcome. So this allows us to think beyond the region and we are thinking of capacity as a whole, going back to the world as a data center. This homogenizes the hardware footprint across a few standard set of regions like compute, storage, and so on. Also, it improves the ability for our services to place them safely and redistribute them, making them more and more region agnostic. These are the essential qualities which we, which we try to enable for global capacity management. Now we covered two ends of the spectrum. 
But does that constitute the entire problem? What else do we have out there? And how do we scale? I'll hand it over to Kenny, who will talk about a bit more on this. Thanks, Ranjith. As Ranjith mentioned, we currently have built solutions for two points in the service spectrum, latency tolerant services and latency sensitive services. But there are more types of services in this spectrum. For example, AI training workloads are themselves stateless, but they may require data locality for training data nearby. As another example, stateful or storage systems like databases and caches are typically multi-tenant services and performing data copies across regions can be very expensive. So shifting these services may be more difficult. There are many more types of services with different requirements in the service spectrum. As Rajiv mentioned in the beginning of the talk, our vision is to view the world as a computer. We want to make service owners region agnostic. More concretely, our vision is to have fully automated, transparent global capacity management for all services at Meta. We want service owners to reason about capacity globally, and we want to provide the appropriate abstractions to model and understand service intent, while still providing infra with flexibility to change placement automatically over time. We made progress for some types of services, as we mentioned in this talk. We have a lot more work to do, and we want to share more details about how we plan to get there. The first step in this direction is to evolve the expectations and contracts service owners have with infrastructure. Today, many service owners still manage capacity regionally. They hard code specific regions, and this adds large amount of operational toil and complexity, especially with fault tolerance, more frequent hardware refresh and decoms, and turning up new data center regions. Instead of reasoning about regional twine jobs and regional reservations, service owners will operate on global twine jobs and global reservations, and infrastructure will automatically decide the regional placement of these workloads for them. Global reservations will be extended to capture more intent from service owners. As an example, this might include latency constraints, sharding constraints, and more. A capacity regionalizer component will determine the exact regional breakdown of this capacity. Furthermore, the regionalizer component will run continuously to improve placement. A capacity orchestrator component then orchestrates all of these changes across all the various global abstractions in a safe way. The capacity orchestrator will be extensible to support more types of services where more planning or orchestration is required. As an example, we can integrate a global shard placement system into global capacity management. Here's what that might look like. This will look similar to how we orchestrate regional shifts today, as Ranjith mentioned, but we can now add extra steps in a specific sequence in the orchestration steps to support globally sharded systems. In this example, the capacity orchestrator can construct a globally shard management system to build additional replicas in the new region that we're adding traffic to. And this can happen after the twine job has been upsized, but before the traffic shift. After the traffic shift, we can do something similar on the downsize path. The capacity orchestrator can instruct a global shard management system to drop the shard replicas in the old region before we downsize the twine job. This process allows us to safely integrate and orchestrate regional shifts for globally sharded services. Much of this work is in progress or is still being designed, we have many more exciting challenges ahead to make this vision a reality. Here are some of these challenges. What are the right global abstractions to capture service intent, but still provide infra with enough flexibility to improve placement and efficiency over time? How do we safely orchestrate regional shifts for all types of services? Many stateful and storage systems are platforms that provide virtual resources, like bytes of storage. How do we model these types of services with global capacity management and still perform regional shifts automatically and safely. The number of regions will continue to grow and these new regions will have different failure characteristics. How do we continue to evolve our disaster readiness strategy and keep this simple for service owners? The journey is only 1% finished and we're excited to see the future of the world as a computer. Thank you.